But hello and welcome to our annual celebration of International Women's Day at the Museum of Zoology. Now I'm Ros Wade, I'm the learning officer at the museum and for audio descriptive purposes I'll tell you that I'm a white woman with brown hair that's fastened back. I'm sitting in my living room so you might be able to see some of my houseplants and pictures on the walls behind me. Now this year we have a panel of four amazing female scientists from the Department of Zoology here in Cambridge all exploring themes of animal evolution. Each will be giving a short talk about their research and inspiration. After they've all spoken, we'll have time to put your questions to them in our um, live panel discussion. So do make sure you put your questions either in the Q&A or the chat um, here on Zoom. Now, just to make you aware, we are recording this evening's event and it will be available on YouTube um, later this week for anybody who's unable to attend this evening. So just check out, keep an eye on our social media for information of when that goes live. So now to the exciting part of today's events, our brilliant panellists that we've got lined up for you today. So first up in giving a talk, we have uh, Dr. Emily Mitchell, who is a Merck Independent Research Fellow in the Department of Zoology. And she'll be taking us back in time to help us to understand early animal evolution. She'll be followed by Dr. Kate Criswell, who's a research associate and Charles and Catherine Darwin research fellow who works in the museum with us. And um, she works on the evolution and development of the vertebrate axial skeleton. So we're looking at things like the backbone and associated structures there. Then Dr. Elia Benito Gutierrez, senior research associate in the department, will be talking about the origins of complex features of the vertebrate head. And that's using one of my favorite animals, Amphioxus. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. And we'll finish the talks with a presentation from Dr. Rahia Mashud, who's a BBSRC a Future Leaders Fellow, um, uncovering aspects of the process of evolution as well. So I think we'll just get started. And Emily, I'm going to pass straight over uh, to you. Thank you, Ross. Uh, so to start for audio descriptive, I'm a white woman with blonde hair and wearing black glasses, and I've got various different fish and aquatic pictures in the background. So I can start by sharing my screen. So it's wonderful to be here this evening. I work here in the Department of Zoology in Cambridge, trying to understand the origins and evolution of early animals. So my group works uh, on understanding very broadly how ecology impacts evolution through deep time, from the origins of animals to the present. So this work includes looking at things like arthropod evolution um, uh, in the Cambrian time period around 520 million years ago, as well as looking at modern day Antarctica, investigating how ecosystems are likely to adapt to climate change. But most of the focus of uh, my group here has been working on Ediacaran fossils, that is those are the first animals. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, I'll work on the Ediacaran and the kind of things we do in the field, for example, in order to investigate the drivers of early animal evolution. So you may not have heard of the Ediacaran fossils, but I think they are very much the most important fossils that we have because they come uh, from around 600 million years ago. And prior to the Ediacaran, life was just microbial for three billion years. But after the Ediacaran is where we have what's known as a Cambrian explosion, where we see all modern major animal groups first appear. And it's during the Ediacaran that we see some of the most important innovations for animals first appear, most notably large body size, as well as the first animals, of course, but also the first evidence of mobility. So we see the first evidence that animals are moving around, leaving behind trails or traces. We also see the first bilaterians, the first reef builders, and as well, as well as the first evidence of predation. But indeed, the first ever fossils found in rocks that were known to be pre-Cambrian was this charnia here, uh, which was found by school children in the 50s. Now, this fossil is incredibly important because it demonstrated that life existed prior to the Cambrian. Now, the fossil record prior to Charnia's discovery was something that troubled uh, people like Darwin, who thought a lot about evolution. He saw the sudden appearance of fossils in Cambrian rocks. However, if his ideas of natural selection were correct, then animal life shouldn't suddenly appear. It should have a gradual buildup. And these Ediacaran fossils do exactly that. 
So most of the oldest of the Ediacaran organisms are taxa such as Chania, which belongs to a group of organisms called Rangiomorphs. Now these Rangiomorphs are very, very strange. They, uh, they have this fractal star branching, that, that is they have branches that have branches that have branches, sometimes down to five different levels. But this makes them really hard to study because while they look superficially like plants, we know because they're found in rocks that were formed in very deep water, they didn't have any daylight. So we know that they couldn't have been photosynthetic like seaweeds or algae. And indeed, their body plans are so unique that it's only found here in the Ediacaran, not elsewhere in the fossil record and not alive today. So as a result, it's not clear for a very long time what they were. And they were so problematic, pretty much every group has been suggested. So microbial colonies, giant protists, lichens, fungi, and even a now extinct kingdom. Life got big and complex, but ultimately failed and died out, paving the way for animals to rise in the Cambrian. However, we know now due to recent work looking at how these Ediacaran organisms grow, as well as chemical fossils, we know that they were indeed some of the first animals to have ever existed. So how do you go about investigating these Ediacaran animals when the body plans are so different to everything else? Well, fortunately, the fossil preservation is really exceptional. So here we've got some Ediacaran organisms. You can see they were stuck to the seafloor, then they have these stems that put them up in the water column, and they fed on the small little plankton in the water using this bit here. And each of these fossil set surfaces here at Mistaken Point have thousands upon thousands of these Ediacaran creatures captured by volcanic ash. So it was rather like Pompeii. Everything was alive and happy, then suddenly this big vol volcanic ash flow comes underwater where they lived and killed everything instantaneously as it was living. But this means that we now have a, essentially a census, an entire population of these Ediacaran organisms um, available to us as fossils. So if we can map them out, then it means we can then analyze them and have a perfect replication of the ecosystem at the time. But how do we go about creating these maps? So when the light is good on the fossil surface, you can see the fossils in amazing detail. But most of the time on the coast of Newfoundland where they're found, uh, the, the weather isn't that, that good, it's quite foggy. And indeed when it's foggy and wet, it's very hard to see the fossils. So, uh, it, well, indeed the worst field season that I ever had, we only had two and a half hours of decent light in the entire month that we were there. So an alternative approach is needed. And so what me and my team have been doing over the last seven years is using this laser scanner. And this uh, goes over the rocks. It doesn't hurt the fossils in any way, which is very important because they are protected. Um, and it's very important not to damage them. But what we do is we pass this laser scanner over the fossils. And if you look closely, you should be able to see a blue light appear. And this is the laser. And as it passes over the fossil, what you do is you get a three-dimensional surface captured on the computer. And this captures incredible amounts of details. So here we have the fossil. The yellow squares here are one centimetre squares. We can see the holdfast, where it was attached to the seafloor, the stem, which put it up in the water column. And then we can see the frond from which it fed with its primary branches and its secondary branches. And this captures the fossil details down to a 40 micron resolution. So that's under half, um, well, it, it's, it's <laughs> well under half a, a millimetre or a tenth of a millimetre. But this scanning takes time. So here we are at Mistaken Point E surface, which is one of the most famous of the Ediacaran fossil sites. And here we have a time lapse video of us laser scanning the fossil surface. So this takes about an hour to do one meter squared. So it takes quite a long time to do. Um, the idea is that you can see the, um, the mechanical arm, which helps uh, get the accuracy that we need, and then the laser itself. Um, uh, but all this time that it takes to run this is well worth it because what it means is we've captured all of the oldest of these Ediacaran fossil communities that are known. Um, and so uh, we can then bring all this digital data back to Cambridge and analyze it. 
So here are some of the surfaces that we've got. So bed B is from Charnwood, and all the rest are from Newfoundland. And each little dot represents a fossil. Different colours represent different species, and the size of the circle corresponds to the height of the water column. And we can see here that there's lots of variety. Some surfaces are covered just by one species, while others have a lot of different species. We also can see different sizes. So Charmwood Forest has some very, very big fossils, 60, 70 centimetres, while others, such as Spaniards Bay, only have really small fossils, a centimetre or two big. But what it means is because we have these wonderful snapshots of Ediac and life, we can use mathematical and ecological approaches that normally wouldn't be appropriate to the fossil record and use them to understand what's going on. So of particular use to us has been using um, spatial methods. So the idea is that for every specimen, such as tree, you mark up where it is and you have leave behind a point map. And different sorts of biological and ecological processes correspond to different patterns. So for example, for these deep sea corals, you can see they're very, very spaced out. And the reason they're spaced out is they're very food re restricted. So they need a certain amount of space around them in order to survive, because otherwise they won't get enough food. So if two corals are too close together, there's not enough food for both of them, so one will die. And this leads to the spacing out of the corals or the points. So to give you an example, I'm going to talk to you about my favourite Ediacaran species, which is Fractifusus. You can see some down here and they lay flat on the seafloor. They have this strange rangiomorph fractal branch. One of the reasons I love it is because there are so many of them. There is uh, well over 8,000 Fractifusus that I've mapped out um, across three different surfaces in Newfoundland. And because it is so abundant and found on several different surfaces, it means we can do some really fun statistical analyses with it. And so what we found when we looked at three different species is we had um, in the first um, surface, you can see this aggregation here, which corresponds to about a, uh, clusters of 10 centimetres. And the shape of this observed spatial pattern line is the sort that you find when you have a reproductive event. The fractifusus were creating offspring or babies. And we know it, it's clusters that were um, caused by dispersal or reproduction because of the shape of this line here. And we can see here that these, the shape of the observed lines are different. And that's because they correspond to multiple different reproductive pr processes. So you have um, the colonizing event and then you've got reproduction and you, then you have reproduction again. So in modern uh, um, seafloor animals, uh, you, there are three different ways that they can reproduce. They can reproduce by breaking off little bits of themselves. They can re uh, reproduce by uh, releasing their spores into the water, or they can reproduce using sterlon or runners rather like strawberry or spider plants. Now in all the 8,000 odd fact I mar marked up, <laughs> there are very few of these fragments or buds, so we know that can't be the main way they're reproducing. So the question then becomes, were they reproducing like corals were spawning, or were they reproducing like spider or cluster plants? And what's really cool is you can look at the shape of the clusters you see, because if something has been released into the water, it's going to be carried by the current and that produces oval clusters. And that's what we see with the largest fractifusus, but not with the medium or the small ones, which means we can re uh, uh, reconstruct how they reproduce. They start off with the colonizing from the water, then they reproduce using these stolon or runners, and these are clones of the parents. They can reproduce again and again. But what's really nice is since this paper was first published, my colleagues Alex Liu and Frankie Dunn have actually found fossil evidence of stolon, and we can see some of the fractifusus ones there. Um, but it's sometimes quite hard to see. We can see the rangimorph front here and the lines coming off. Here, which are the stolon or runners. So what this is, is this is fossil preserved evidence of the stolon that were originally predicted by the maths. And that to me is probably the most exciting thing about this particular set of studies, is that they demonstrate the power of statistics and maths to help understand these really first early animals. 
And so I will finish off now with thanking all my many, many wonderful collaborators and field assistants that have helped me work throughout the years. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. That was that was brilliant. And um, being able to see something like that from something so old is incredible. That's just amazing. Really fascinating. Thank you so much. So we're going to um, move on now to um, uh, Kate. Now, just to, as a reminder, if you've got any questions for Emily, do pop them into the Q&A or the chat and we will be coming back later and, and answering those. But now we're going to um, move go over to Kate Criswell, who's going to be exploring some aspects of evolution of the vertebrate skeleton. So over to you, Kate. Uh, thank you, Roz. And um, as a descriptor of me, so I am a white woman with straight blonde hair and I've got on some sort of dark teal glasses. Okay. So um, for my research, I am interested in how vertebrates build their backbones. So basically, for all of the diversity that we have in vertebrate life, um, we have a lot of really interesting shapes, sizes, and numbers of vertebrae. And um, I study how we arrived at that amazing diversity, both using sort of a deep time evolutionary and paleontological approach and a developmental approach where I look at embryos. And most of this is focused on fishes, both bony fishes and cartilaginous fishes. But before I get into my research, I just wanted to give a little bit of a brief overview of how I got into science in case anyone watching might be interested in, you know, how they could, or people they know, um, children, that sort of thing might be interested in this path, how they could get into it as well. So um, I grew up in America, in Pennsylvania, in a, an area that looked like this picture on the top left. That's a lake near uh, my hometown. And I was first interested in science by um, learning about rocks and minerals. I think I got a kit that looked very similar to this one when I was a kid from my uncle who was a geologist. And you dig out the rocks from this matrix, you clean them up and you identify them. And this became the basis of my rock collection, which I still have, of course. Um, and so I sort of got really into uh, geology and paleontology as a kid and I would go looking for fossils and rocks at outcrops near my house, I'd find things like trilobites and brachiopods. And this is a much, <clears throat> much older, excuse me, older picture of me, um, but still, like Emily, still um, looking for, for fossils and rocks. And then just a bit about my career trajectory, um, sort of the path I took through university to get where I am today. First, I did a Bachelor of Science degree in Earth Sciences. Um, there I am on some more outcrops. Uh, and then I was able to do an internship at the Academy of Natural Sciences. This is a natural history museum in Philadelphia, where I studied a bunch of baby fossil fish that were preserved in, in Pennsylvania rocks. And this is kind of when I knew I wanted to be a scientist and look at bones for uh, my career. Uh, I then moved to Texas to do a master's in paleontology, and I learned a lot more about skeletons of all sorts of vertebrates here. And for my PhD, I moved to Chicago, and this is kind of when I was first exposed to developmental biology, and I learned that you could answer similar types of evolutionary questions using both fossils and skeletons, as well as embryos and development. And so now, and for the past five years, I've been able to work in this amazing building. This is our Museum of Zoology, and um, that's where I am now. And I'll tell you a, a bit more about what I do here. So I mentioned before, I'm interested in how fishes build their backbones. And I'm just highlighting here a few examples of some fish backbones from, uh, these are CT scan reconstructions of different fish from our museum collections. And you can see that um, they have really, different numbers of, of vertebrae from this hatfish, hatchet fish here to this uh, moray eel down at the bottom. They have really different shapes of vertebrae and sizes. And um, so I'm just really interested overall in learning how this diversity came to be both through evolution and through development. Um, so when I look at development of the backbone of fishes, I mostly study these guys here. So these are skates and they're, uh, they're part of this group of cartilaginous fishes 
So they're close relatives of sharks and stingrays. And uh, it's really important to study cartilaginous fishes because they make up this one major branch of the vertebrate evolutionary tree. And on the other side, we have all the ones with bony skeletons. So all the bony fishes, all of the birds, mammals, reptiles, that sort of thing. So by looking at cartilaginous fishes, we can sort of compare them with bony fishes and kind of understand what was going on in those earliest vertebrates at the very earliest branches of the tree of life. Um, so yeah, this is a skate here, a little hatchling. And skates are pretty good animals for studying development because they lay eggs unlike most sharks and stingrays. So here are some egg cases I have in my hand on the left. And uh, they develop a bit like a chicken where they have one big egg with a yolk inside and a, a sort of clear jelly layer that's a lot like an egg white. And there's one embryo on that yolk that uses that yolk up as they grow. And uh, around the beaches in the UK and uh, in a lot of other places as well, you can find these empty egg cases that have washed up after the, the little baby skates have hatched out. So here's what a very young skate embryo looks like. It's got a head right here. Uh, they start to wiggle as soon as they're able to. And here the tail is extending out. Here's the yolk outside of the egg. They have these big external gills that they then resorb back in. And here's one with its big fins that have fused up at the top. They take about five months from when the eggs are laid to when these little baby skates hatch out. And they, when they hatch out, they look pretty much like miniature little adults. Um, they're very sweet and they're really fun to work with. So to look inside the eggs and study the, the development, we can use torches to shine them underneath. So uh, there are a couple of movies on the left here showing uh, the embryos inside. We can use the torches to help stage them to, so to figure out sort of how far along they are in development. And you can identify little bits of anatomy like the, the fin buds beginning to form or those external gills. And on the right, there's a picture showing a little bit older skate. You can see the eyes, these dark patches here, those big fins connecting all the way to the, the tip of the snout and a curly Q tail. And then it's sitting on top of this big yolk here. And so I want to talk about a few experiments and techniques I used to study um, fish uh, backbone development and, and anatomy. And these include things like using fluorescent dyes to track embryonic cells to their eventual location in the skeleton, um, clearing and staining the skeleton to see what the anatomy looks like inside. And then in the museum here, we do a lot of CT scanning to study uh, skeletons without having to damage the, the specimens themselves. So to use these fluorescent dyes, I take a, a really tiny needle. You can see here in this left image, and it's filled with this pink dye that fluoresces really bright pink under a certain uh, wavelength of light. And I've cut open an egg case here, and you can see the little embryo, and I'm holding it with forceps. If you look down the microscope, it would look like this. You can see my forceps underneath, and I'm interested in these little blocks of tissue here. Those are what go on to form the individual vertebrae that make up the backbone. So I can take my little glass needle and poke uh, the, the embryo just ever so slightly and leave a little bit of dye be behind. And then I can follow, let those embryos develop for a couple months and follow them to see where the dye ends up. So this is an example of the result of one of those experiments. Here we're looking kind of at a side view of the vertebrae. So here are four different vertebrae. Um, and you can see all of these bright pink dots. Those are little bits of that fluorescent dye that have been passed down from all of the cell divisions from the embryo all the way into the cartilage of the backbone. So I do these kinds of experiments to see which parts of the embryo end up making which parts of the, of the backbone through development. Uh, another technique I use is clearing and staining. So uh, I use a couple different stains. One is called Alcyon Blue, and it stains unmineralized cartilage. So in this skate on the right, you can see all those bits that are blue. That's cartilage that's still kind of wobbly. So like your ear, cartilage in your ear, that's unmineralized. It's still very sort of pliable. 
And alizarin red is this red stain here, and that stains bone and mineralized cartilage. So this is cartilage that has a lot of calcium in it. It's very hard and robust and not very bendy. And then we can use an enzyme called trypsin to digest the soft tissue a little bit and use glycerol to make it crystal clear. So you can see right through the tissue into the skeleton and see exactly how those parts fit together in the same sort of position they are when the animal's alive. And then finally, I wanted to mention a little bit about CT scanning. So in our department here, we have a CT scanner and it works a lot like a medical CT scanner, but it provides really high resolution images. So I can take jars from our, our uh, museum collections, so our storeroom, and pick out some fish that I think will be really interesting, have very interesting backbones, like this eel here, or these pipefish over here, or this frogfish. And the way the CT scanner works is we have an x-ray source, and it shines the x-rays through a specimen to a detector on the other side. So the specimen in the middle, it rotates ever so slightly between each set of x-rays and uh, an image is captured at each of these steps. And then we can put all of these x-ray images together to reconstruct the anatomy. So I'll show you one uh, example using a mud skipper. This is called uh, periophthalmus. They're cute little fish that come out onto the mud and sort of flop around hunting. And this is what the results of the scans look like. So you have a set of slices here. We're going from the head all the way through from the head to the tail through the fish. And you can see the skull here. And there'll be some fins on either side and fins down below. And here are the vertebrae in the middle. So we're sort of going through the vertebrae one by one uh, as we go through the body. And uh, we get these sorts of uh, sets of slices that look like this. They look like cross sections through the body of the fish. And um, they're a little bit difficult to interpret, but we can re reconstruct them in three dimensions. So here's what the fish would look like uh, sort of from the outside looking at the skin. And then we can take the skin off digitally and view the skeleton underneath. So the CT scanning allows us to look at uh, the, the skeletons of all these different fishes while keeping these really old historical specimens we have in the museum completely intact for other people to study. So I use this combination of CT scanning and development in, uh, in skate embryos mostly uh, to, to sort of put everything together to figure out how diverse the backbone is, what the backbone looks like across all these fishes, and, and sort of compare the development uh, and see how the embryo gives rise to the skeletal structure that we see in these fish. And I just wanna end um, also by acknowledging and thanking some of my amazing female colleagues, uh, lots of women I've had in as lab, lab mates and sort of mentors and, and collaborators over the years. Thank you for listening and um, thank you Roz for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kate. That's, um, that was really, really interesting and uh, such beautiful images as well. Those baby skates are they're very, very cute. They're lovely. <laughs> it must be great to work with those. So thank you so much. And again, if you have any questions for Kate, please do um, pop them into uh, the chat or into the Q&A as well. Um, and we're going to be moving on now to um, a talk from Elia Benito Gutierrez about um, still on the theme of vertebrates and their um, evolution. So I'm going to pass over to Elia now. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, thank you very much, Rose. Uh, so for descriptive uh, purposes, I'm a white female with brown hair and very thick um, black glasses. And um, I just wanted to start uh, as uh, similar uh, to Kate saying what it motivated me. As many of you, I actually grew up inspired by David Attenborough uh, documentaries. And this is actually part of the trailer announcing life of our planet that we can see in, in Netflix now. And um, just, just a second, can you see, can you see my, oh, okay. Yeah, 
And, uh, and I still now continue to be amazed by the vast, vast diversity of animal forms and their capabilities to do extraordinary things. Um, and here what you can see is the migration of uh, fishes, um, the uh, amazing capabilities of organization of insects, uh, migrations, and uh, hunting capacities uh, of um, these, all these animals. And even more fascinating is the thought uh, that was pioneered by Charles Darwin and that we are all related. We all descend from a common ancestor. And this is what Charles Darwin published in 19, uh, 1859 in this book, The Origin of Species, where a book that actually uh, changed, uh, uh, completely changed the world really, and the society that we live in. And this is actually how we see the world today. This is a beautiful phylogenetic tree representing all animal life on earth from a beautiful book, uh, um, Welcome to the Museum, Animalium, written by Katie Scott and Jenny Room, that I invite you to read, especially if you have young children. The take home message here is that we are all evolutionary related and linked through these uh, different nodes you can see in the tree to uh, common ancestors and rooted in at, uh, at the base of the tree by a common ancestor that actually gave rise to all uh, animals um, in, probably during a period that uh, Emily actually explained uh, before. And so one of the main questions that has driven my entire career and that of others that work with me is how this extraordinary diversity of animal forms appears in evolution and how it develops this uh, morphological diversity and how this uh, is maintained. And this is what we are investigating um, in, in, in my lab. In, in the lab, we particularly focus on uh, this side of, uh, of the tree where you can see represented all chordates on earth, including animals with a backbone um, uh, um, that you have heard from Kate, all animals with a vertebrate column. And we are basically under, uh, interested in understanding how um, chordates were originated and how they diversify into all these animals that you can see here through evolution. And this is probably, um, so the first chordates probably up, uh, appear in the Cambrian explosion as, um, as um, Emily just told you. And lots of things have happened during uh, all this time, right? So on the left, um, what you can see is, is a summary of some of uh, these um, events that happen through evolution. And the first of all is how the vertebrates appear. They appear through a revolutionary modification of the pre-existing body plan. And that uh, in, uh, in this case included the formation of uh, an autocore, corda dorsalis, which is what gives a name to the entire chordate film. And, um, and, and, and this modification of the body plan uh, for the first time also includes a dorsal neural tube and a brain that is located in the dorsal side of the body, unlike in, in, uh, in insects in the Drosophila, for example, and the uh, fruit fly that is located in the ventral side, right? So the apparition of the vertebrate column, uh, as you have heard, is basically marking the origin of vertebrates. And it occurs through a very um, um, in, in, interesting transition, that is the invertebrate to vertebrate transition that many labs are actually uh, trying to understand. And, and then um, going uh, through this uh, branch here of evolution, we know now that there has been whole genome duplication events that directly or indirectly have contributed to, um, to the apparition of um, predatory um, characters, for example, such as jaws uh, and person's organs, and also um, other morphological innovations such as wings uh, that we can see in birds and fins and other uh, specializations that you can see here that allowed vertebrates to conquer land, water, and air. And to understand how this happened, to understand the molecular and cellular basis of all these morphological innovations, we use Amphioxus as a model system. Is this little animal located here is unique in its kind. And 
And, uh, and, and you can see right here that it has the privileged phylogenetic position that locates it at the root of all uh, the chordate tree. So they are very simple in morphology. And we can actually consider them like a minimalistic version of a vertebrate. And that's why it's so interesting to study because you are able to study the complexity of a vertebrate into, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a context that is simpler. And I will put a video. Ooh, it is it's not it's not playing and i was going to put a video to show that um uh, what is the um characteristics of uh, amphioxus but it's not playing for some reason and um maybe maybe what i can do is to do like this so you can actually see it um oh something has happened here okay Oh, sorry. All right, so let's see if it plays now. Amphioxus has a nerve cord which relays commands from the brain. It has gill slits, just as human embryos do. It has segmented muscles that allow it to move, but the real innovation was the nodal cord, a stiffening rod reinforcing its shape. This was the precursor of a backbone. We carry vestiges of a nodal cord, the discs in our spine. Our spines place us in a special group of chordates called vertebrates. So in essence, we have many features in common with Amphioxus, and um, which suggests that our common ancestor might have looked like um, an Amphioxus. We have currently um, three living genera of Amphioxus. Only the Branchiostoma one has been thoroughly studied. And we know, um, and, and, and these are actually depicted in this uh, picture here, these are Branchiostoma lanceolatum from the Mediterranean. And after sequencing three, uh, uh, three genomes uh, from three different uh, branchiostoma species, we have come to the realization that it, the Amphioxus genome is one of the best preserves in chordates. The cartoon here illustrates um, how chunks of Amphioxus chromosomes, so these are Amphioxus chromosomes, can be recognized in our own chromosomes. And here what you can see is the correspondent uh, chromosomal regions uh, color code in the same color in the human genome. So the Amphioxus genome is very similar in the structure and content, but is devoid of the, of the genetic redundancy that was generated through vertebrate evolution and through whole genome duplications. Amphioxus has also a vertebrate-like development in anatomy. As you can see here, they develop like vertebrates. Um, uh, and they have uh, many of the features uh, that uh, we can see in vertebrates. And they are uncommon uh, as a model organism in that they are long-lived, they live a long time. Here you can see they have a very complex life cycle, life cycle including a very long planktonic phase. And the adults live in, in the seafloor. It takes them one year to, to, to become uh, young adults and three years to become sexually mature. And in the seafloor is where all our work starts. This is one of our trips to the field in the Maldives Islands, where we not only collect amphioxus to bring them to the lab, but we also collect the gravel. So you can see here a piece of seafloor that we bring into the lab with the, all the animals that live and all the entire community to basically integrate in our ma ma marine microcosmos, you can see here. This consists of a system of natural seawater constantly flowing that mimics seasonal fluctuations and consists of a system of tanks interconnected, as you can see, in a two-tier configuration that allow us to have in one tier the amphioxus and in the other all the animals that live with them in their natural habitat. We also cultivate the, the uh, phytoplankton, as you can see here, to basically feed the entire community. And 
like this, we have achieved uh, a microcosmos in the lab where not only amphioxus thrive, but also other animals. And you can see here all our residents, other of our residents like crabs, uh, starfish, we have also anemonas, and we have, in, um, um, we have been lucky enough to have animals that are very, very difficult to cultivate, like sea squirts here. Um, which have never been um, uh, raised in the lab. And our system is actually um, allowing them to um, breed and propagate in our system. And this is how we have managed to have an inland mentic ecosystem that we can actually use for research in the lab. And this has completely changed the way we work. We are no longer limited by the availability of amphioxus in amphioxus embryos in the lab, as we were 10 years ago. And so we can actually perform now a number of procedures. We can have, uh, we can actually do surgery on them. You can actually see here how well they recover and how happy they are in the system. We can um, um, visualize the development in vivo with the animal alive in the microscope. And we can actually do drug screenings um, um, of many sorts and see, for example, the effects of human activity on, 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 on planktonic larvae. We can also study the behavior of adults. And here, what you can see is some behavioral assays that we have for embryos. So these are little embryos uh, responding to the light. These are a little bit older embryos also responding differently to the, to the light. And, and here we can actually see what development does in terms of acquiring sensitivity for the environment and how development uh, in normal and perturbed condition affect the relation of the embryo towards the environment. And just to give you a sense of how is our life in the lab, this is the very hectic period in the lab uh, when we have um, uh, the amphioxus breeding season. It's a very intense period of the year um, where we make our animals to breed. Uh, we espe especially cultivate um, um, plankton for them because they are really, really tiny. And we spend most of the time in, uh, of our time in the microscope, as you can see here. The embryos are extremely small, and you can only see them through the microscope. They are extremely transparent, as you will see in a moment. And we basically spend our time taking care of these gorgeous embryos. As you can see here, there is a little bit of algae in their guts, so they actually happily eat all this uh, phytoplankton that we grow for them, and they are shiny as diamonds in water. We love them. And this has allowed us to, in the recent years, to develop a new array of approaches and methods to understand cell fate specification uh, at a multi-scale level in amphioxus, with particularly emphasis, of course, on evol evolutionary conserved cell types that are key to morphological innovation. On the right here, what you can see is Toby, Giacomo, Dan, and Michael have been key to uh, this success, uh, to this progress. And they have developed pipelines to digitalize uh, embryos, as you can see here. They have basic, we have, we have now protocols for single cell genomics and single cell morphometrics that allow you to visualize gene expression and cell shape changes at a single cell level. And all of this we can now integrate in situ um, by special profiling all the information we take from here in the context of the embryo um, and combine all these to understand how tissue and organs form and by comparing all this knowledge from amphioxus with other uh, chordates, uh, specifically with vertebrates, we can also begin to understand how this feature evolved. And this is an example of the digitalization uh, of the pipeline um, of the digitalization pipeline that we use in the lab, amphioxus are very small. So uh, one of the great advantages is that it's possible to do this at a whole organismal level, which is something that you cannot do with other model systems. And this is an amphioxus embryo that is 30 hours old. And the raw data is obtained with a confocal microscope. And the, here, what you can see in gray is all the nuclei of the cells. And in uh, yellow, what you can see is a marker that we use to uh, visualize the cilia. As you can see, um, these are planktonic larvae, so they use the cilia to swim in, in, in the water. And, um, and here, what you can see is actually the nervous system. So these are all the axonal tracts that are in the neural tube, and this here is the brain. So 
then what we can do is once we have this, when it can specifically recognize uh, different tissues using different labels, usually gene expression or um, protein expression, like neurotransmitters or other kind of uh, um, of markers, and then um, we can actually segment these uh, images. And, and from here, we can actually apply quantitative methods to understand how shape, how volume, how this is the density, and how um, th all these different parameters act to basically form an organ and a tissue. And our approach actually allows identifying every single individual cell that is located in all these tissues. As you can see here, we know every single cell that forms the brain in light, uh, in light blue. Here is the notochord in red. And here in blue, you can see the neural tube, the tail, bar, which is a growing part of the embryo in the posterior part, and the and the endoderm here, which is where the gut forms. So because we are a lot, we, because we, we can actually identify every single cell inside the tissue, then we can computationally dissect all this, as you can see here, and then we can actually study particular morphological features per specific tissue in isolation. And focusing in one of the most important chordate innovations, so the notochord, what um, Toby Andrews did in the lab is to use single cell morphometrics to make the most comprehensive catalog of notochord cell shapes, actually the most comprehensive catalog of cell shapes in general ever published, demonstrating that the shape of the notochord cells, as you can see here, is predictive of cell type. And here, for example, you can see this is a dorsal Muller cell in pink. This is the central cell um, that is called stack of coins, which is shared with all chordates, including vertebrates. And this one in yellow is the, are the ventral uh, Muller cell. And what we saw also is that these, um, these, these cells each of them follow a specific trajectories of cell shape change that allow their maturation during development and that help to the, um, to the body extension while the embryo is growing. And now focusing on the brain, my last example of some research that we have been doing recently is um, that we have recently found that uh, cells in amphioxus um, divide following a precise spatiotemporal sequence to form different parts of the brain at different time points. It's not like us, we have all the brain kind of grows at the same time. In amphioxus, each part of the, of the brain grows uh, at a different pace. And we realize about that because we are able to detect these pink cells are, pink, are cells that are dividing. And at the beginning of the development, they are located in the ventral part of the brain. So here, what you can see is the part of the embryo we are focusing. Uh, so this is at the early stages, these two here, and at later stages, uh, similar to the larvae that you have see, been swimming. And, and this, is, this is actually the part of the brain we are focusing. And it, what you can see is that initially, these cells are dividing ventrally, but then later, um, the cells that are dividing are dorsal and anterior and then dorsal again. And here in these cross sections, you can see very well how these cells are positioned and, and the dynamics that they use to basically form this, the brain in, in time. And so we wanted to know what these cells are fated. And one way of knowing what they will become is by using gene expression. And and so we basically follow these uh, cells. So Giacomo Gattoni in, in, in my lab follow these cells. And here what you can see is, um, is the brain. This is the region of the eye. Uh, amphioxus are cyclops. So this is the frontal eye. The eye of amphioxus has a different, different cell types. These in purple are glutamatergic. They use glutamate as a transmitter. These are serotonergic. They use serotonin as a transmitter. And if we prevent um, these cells from being born, what we get is embryos that lack serotonergic cells in their eye, but not glutamatergic cells. So these 
bursts of cell division are producing specific cell types um, at different time points in development. And these serotonergic cells are actually very important for the life of the embryos. They send these uh, axonal projections, you can see here in white, connect with other cell types uh, expressing other neurotransmitters that allow the brain to communicate different uh, um, sorts of information. Here in the cartoon, you can actually see very well how these cells are projecting. And later in development, what we can see is that these cells basically develop a very complex um, pattern of connectivity. These um, cells, uh, again, mark in white. They are connected with these axons in green here, which are connecting to the primary motor center in a way that allows the embryo to basically perceive a visual information and basically transmit it to the motor system so they can swim away or they can have a specific reaction according to the stimuli. They also connect to other peptidergic neurons like here in, in, uh, in red. And, and, and overall, basically, they uh, form a very complex morphology uh, of connections. And we know this happens for a long time uh, during the development of amphioxus for months. Uh, amphioxus are developing new neurons in uh, new uh, parts of the brain. And what we have seen is that the adult has a very complex um, pattern of connectivity with glutamatergic uh, cells here connecting and GABAergic cells connecting in a part of the brain that is in gene expression very similar to one of our most advanced part of the brain, the telencephalon. And that's how we have a come to the realization that some parts of the, our brain are really ancestral. And here, just to put a couple of examples, in blue is our uh, is, is is a part that is um, the corresponding to the hypothalamus here represented in the mouse. Um, that we can observe already in the embryos and other parts like the telencephalon here, which is our cerebral cortex is uh, basically developing very late in amphioxus, but this actually means that is an, a still an ancestral part, regardless how advanced it is uh, of our brain. And with this, I just would like to basically thank the entire lab and all, a lot of people who has basically uh, helped me through uh, this journey, this fantastic journey, collaborators, um, our sponsors that make possible that have made possible uh, this research, and of course uh, the amphioxus here. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, Elia. That was um, really, really interesting, and seeing those similarities between amphioxus and us was um, really, really interesting too. So now we're going to go on to our last talk before we have our um, uh, uh, panel discussion. So I'm going to pass over now to Rahia Mashu. So Rahia, over to you. Oh, I think you're still muted. Sorry, rookie mistake um, to the Zoom. Uh, anyways, hi, I'm Rahia. Um, I am a Southeast Asian brown woman um, with dark hair and I'm sitting in front of a, some cartoon pizzas. Um, uh, unfortunately, my talk isn't going to be about pizzas. Um, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about animals and the kind of work I do in the Department of Zoology. Um, so very broadly speaking, I'm interested uh, in how we inherit the environments of our parents and how this can manifest for multiple generations and even impact the course of our evolution. And this is a concept that is relevant for all members of the animal kingdom, including myself. So my work really draws from genetics, animal behavior and evolutionary biology to understand the mechanisms whereby you can have um, the experiences of your parents get inherited by you and get transmitted transgenerationally. And there's increasing evidence that heritability isn't that simple. We traditionally think about heritability as about the genes that we inherit from our parents. Um, but take, for example, this like very highly heritable trait of body weight. Um, we can sequence um, individuals, um, hundreds and hundreds of individuals, and we find that only about 5 to 20% of variation in this trait is really 
explained by these gene sequences alone. So once you take into account parental lifestyle factors, such as stress and diet and age, you start to account for more and more of that variation. And so what this suggests is that we inherit more than just our parents' genes, we're also in inheriting their environmental legacies. And what I've been really interested in the lab is what are the biological mechanisms that could facilitate this? And so there's increasing evidence that this might have to do with plasticity in gene expression or how genes are regulated. So every cell in our body has miles and miles of DNA sequenced like right here. And these letters are used over and over again to make up our genes. And each of these genes codes for an extremely important and useful product. Genes are transcribed into RNA or expressed and they're translated into proteins. And these proteins make up the components of our cells, organs, and ultimately who we are. Um, and you inherit about 3 billion of these uh, sequences from each of your parents. But there's this additional layer of information in the form of epigenetic marks and signals. And this is because DNA in your cell is normally compacted by wrapping DNA around these like histone proteins. And this is really so that you can fit miles and miles of this DNA into your tiny cells. But in order, but com compacting them essentially silences them. And in order for genes to be expressed um, and be available for all the machinery in your cells that read your genes, you really kind of have to loosen up and open up this structure. Um, and there are various chemical uh, marks and signals that help enable this. Um, so for example, you can have things like DNA methylation or even modifications to these histone proteins themselves that are helping with this wrapping process. And so depending on the type of chemical mark and its placement can determine whether a gene is expressed or not and also how much. And what I find really interesting about these processes is that various environmental factors can shape the expression of these marks. So things like levels of parental care, the social environment in your diet can really impact gene expression by changes in these epigenetic marks. And so what I've been really interested in the lab is how do these sort of accumulate and get passed on across generations? And so understanding these biological mechanisms has an impact on how we understand healthy development. We know that parents contribute to their offspring development over and above just the transmission of their DNA. And this can really help set trajectories for health and disease. And it matters in terms of how we conceptualize true biological differences in populations that maybe are based on geography or race or class, which could really ultimately boil down to environmental differences like access to clean air or healthy diets or what have you. And finally, it matters for our evolution and predicting rates of change in human and animal populations, particularly in our increasingly changing world. And so a lot of the work that I've been doing in this area is to try to understand how these genetic and epigenetic pathways really contribute to gene expression in response to the environment in response to the environment and how they might impact inheritance for a number of generations. And I've worked on these questions uh, using a number of species in the past, like mice and humans, and they have long intergenerational times and are sort of cumbersome to work with, especially if you've met other humans. And to really ask about these like long-term transgenerational changes, you really need to work with systems where you can manipulate life histories in the lab and track development across a number of generations without sort of growing old and um, conking out yourself. Um, and so, uh, I had a little, okay. Right, and so, I sort of despaired about these questions and the ability to do them until I met this like amazingly weird social insect called the burying beetle. So these beetles show a very highly elaborate repertoire of parental care. They raise their a young on a carrion nest, usually a small dead animal, which they pre uh, prepare prior to hatching. And once larvae hatch, parents feed and defend the nest to ensure survival. And so this is like a very handy little system um, and I started working on some of the questions I'll talk about with someone called Becky Kilner in zoology. Um, let me just click over. Right, and so this is a species that is native to the UK. 
This is a picture of a burying beetle in the wild that I uh, snapped when I was out trapping um, just out up the road in, uh, I think, Gamelin Gay Wood. And so we can trap them and bring them into the lab to study. And in order to, uh, for these beetles to breed, they just need a carcass, as I mentioned, of a small vertebrate animal, usually a mouse or a small bird. And we can recreate this in the lab by providing a pair of beetles a carcass to breed on. And so here they are cleaning the carcass up. They're picking off all the fur. They're smearing it with the guts of the carcass and their own antimicrobial fluids, um, shaping it into a nice little ball to make into this nice little edible nest for the offspring to feed off of. And then somewhere in there, they made it and uh, laid a bunch of eggs uh, in this busy schedule. And so this is like, so they'll sort of hit the end of their process here. It's this nice, clean, round ball that's ready for their larvae. And it's extremely weird and disgusting, but also wonderful at the same time. And what's kind of amazing is that we can manipulate the care that the beetles receive in the lab just by removing parents prior to hatching. And we can repeat this for several generations. And what my colleagues have shown is that these populations start to show really rapid adaptive changes in larval behavior, morphology, and even in the kinds of care that they provide. And so what I wanted to know is what's occurring in these populations at the level of genes. And so I basically sampled from these full care, these populations that had consistently received care or no care and extracted DNA uh, and then se basically sequenced their actual sequence, measured epigenetic marks, and also looked at gene expression. And so we can look at gene expression first, and gene expression is really just the output of the underlying genetic and epigenetic processes that are going on. And what we see is that the first time these beetles experience the loss of care, this is like an extremely stressful event for them, their gene expression is characterized by primarily an emergency stress response with genes mostly being devoted to things in the stress pathway and also probably immune activation. But after 30 generations, there's still this stress response, but this is occurring at a much lower level. And so it's almost as if they're, no, they're insensitive to the stress of losing their parents at this point. And this is coming alongside changes in genes for feeding and social behavior that might actually be compensating for the loss of care. And so what I wanted to ask is, can we measure both genetic and epigenetic change across this uh, adap adaptive process? And how are those con both contributing to the gene expression that we see? And we can look at genetic, so this is the genetic sequence change um, in these populations. I'm just showing every gene essentially along the genome and every dot here represents the position of a gene within the genome. And the higher this peak is, the more different the populations are in terms of their actual DNA sequence. Um, and so not surprisingly, we can detect hundreds of these changes and some of these genes are involved in things like growth and social behavior that I talked earlier. Uh, and many of the pathways that I talked about earlier. And so this was interesting. But then we can also look at DNA methylation and we find that methylation is extremely sensitive to the environment. So the removal of care changes methylation at like a lot of genes, a lot more genes than we see DNA sequence change in. And we find that over time, some of these uh, changes become fixed in the population. So they start to define these two populations. And so this suggested to us that not only is methylation sensitive to the environment, it's also reflecting the ancestral divergence that has occurred between these two populations. And so this is quite exciting to us. Um, and we're still trying to work out what it means. And so the summary of just that quickly is just to say we can detect these genetic changes and we can detect these epigenetic changes. And these aren't always happening in the same genes. These are almost like they're parallel processes. And so they may be interacting with each other and we don't quite know how. And what we're interested in now is disentangling the relative contribution of these things. Can you have one without the other? And what's the ultimate role of these in sort of pacing the rate of change? Uh, across generations.
Um, and so with that, since it's Women's Day, I should probably mention the uh, interesting and uh, amazing women that I've worked with in the past and thank all these people for working with me throughout my research career. Oh, thank you um, so much. That was a uh, really, really interesting and um, yeah, learning about inheriting more than genes. I think that's probably something quite new to a lot of people. So it's really fascinating to hear about that. Now I'm going to um, pin all of our um, panelists. So hopefully this will work. Um, Okay, and if I can ask you all to unmute, that would be great. We've had a couple of questions um, come in, so I think we'll start off with those actually. And um, the first question is from Daisy asking, how long did it take you to develop your methods? And I think this is something that's relevant to all of you. So I don't know, maybe if we start with Emily, um, go in the order that you gave your talks, how long did it take to sort of work on your methods that you were using? Um, well, I, I very much approached it uh, from a, we've got lots of data, what can we do do for it? So the, the key thing for me is all the methods were actually really well established in forest ecology. People just hadn't considered applying them in this way to fossils or even animals. But in the last few years, people are increasingly looking at uh, kind of living animals. And indeed, that's some of my work has looked at things like corals and sponges and what's going on there. Okay, that's really fast. So taking sort of another discipline and, and yeah. adding it into yours, that's really interesting. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot easier than having to develop, develop <laughs> brand new methods myself. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Kate, what about you? Um, yeah, um, so <clears throat> working with the skates, um, I do a lot of the work with live animals only in the summers. So I go to a marine lab in, um, in Massachusetts in the US where they keep the skates for us. And so all the all of the live animal method development has to happen in kind of a short time span. It's sort of a very big rush where you're, you're just in the lab all the time, you know, using the time you have to, to um, get done what you can. So yeah, it, it's, um, it's pretty intense, but we do, pretty, do things pretty quickly. So kind of trying to, and, and optimizing method within a couple of weeks. Um, and if it works, you just run with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, and um, Elia, same question to you. It's actually funny that Kate mentioned that because we had, uh, years ago, we had the same problem. So amphioxus only reproduce one night in the entire year. <laughs> and that's why we took the animals to the lab. This uh, development of the bringing the amphioxus to the lab, it took like uh, 15 years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> but but uh, it took a long time but now we are we are able to do so much that I could have never possibly have dreamed of when I was doing my PhD so it has also mm -hmm. a component of amazing satisfaction yeah and Rahia you want to what about the the methods that you've been using how long has it taken to develop those well I um I sort of uh, benefit from a lot of genetics work that other people have done because I can kind of help implement into them and I have also benefited from a lot of people that have worked on this system before so I've kind of basically leached on people who have worked for a very long time to train me very quickly on these things. <laughs> yeah so we've had a couple more questions come in this is great so this is a question for Kate, but for everyone, I think it it, um, it refers to all of you. What are the challenges and joys of working with live animals or embryos versus working with sort of rocks and fossils? So um, things that move around, I guess, rather than things that don't. Yeah, this is a, a great question. And I would say um, <clears throat> working with live animals that, and, and the embryos in particular can be extremely stressful. It's really fun. It's amazing to see them moving around and developing and to watch that. And I absolutely love it, but they definitely are, are a bit fragile sometimes. So we've had a few cases at the Marine Lab in the summer where big storms have come through and caused power outages. And the skate embryos like pretty cold water, water, so they have to be sort of around 15 degrees Celsius or, or lower. And so we had, 
you know, the chiller wasn't working and the, the water temperature was spiking and there was only one building in the whole campus that had cold water. So we were running through thunderstorms, carrying these baskets of eggs. You know, so it's like, it can be very stressful. <laughs> Everything worked out in the end, but I found um, working with, with the, the skeletons and the, and the fossils to be a little more relaxing. <laughs> Yeah, Emily, I don't know if you want to contribute to this as somebody who works with fossils much more. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't work on uh, kind of lab work with mm -hmm. living things, but I do uh, kind of use uh, lots of video and photo data from living kind of deep sea communities in, in Antarctica. And I think the advantage of fossils is they're there, they're not going to die on you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I would say the main disadvantage is you're limited. You've only got so many fossils to work with and you may not know, you may never see all of the ones that you could do, but it is inherently a limited resource. Whereas if you have the ability to um, breed animals actually in the lab, then you've got by well, controlled environments, so you know much more what's going on with them, but also you, you don't have quite so much a, a limited resource in that way. Yeah. So um, again, Elia and Rahia, because you both have sort of these more controlled systems. Um, are there what are the things that particularly are there things that are particularly enjoyable about working with those systems? Are there things that you find particularly challenging? I don't know. Is there... um, well, I think that the thing about working with animals that you always have to remember is that you kind of work for them. So if you're doing like <laughs> developmental work. Um, I remember during my PhD, we were trying to get very precise uh, measurements of what mothers do as soon as a pup is born. And mice actually don't care about your schedule. They'll give birth at any time during the day. So I remember like a team of us would like keep each other up in the lab <laughs> all through the night waiting for these to be born. And then like they would be born and everyone would be like, we have to go, we have to go. And then half of us were still asleep. Awesome. So it does kind of get quite chaotic um, yeah. working with animals. A lot of coffee required then. It's so true, actually. It's so true. You totally work for them. It's, mm -hmm. it's very intense. But also, um, also I remember my fir the first time I saw an amphioxus embryo to develop right in front of my eyes. I think I was mm -hmm. kind of stuck to the microscope for hours till the point that they had all the ocular smart <laughs> eyes. They were so beautiful and you were seeing that happening in right in front of your eyes that then basically a sleepless night it doesn't care <laughs> you're so happy anyway <laughs> that's a magical experience yeah so we have a question now from olivia who asks when did you know you wanted to study zoology and have you seen any difficulties as women in stem at all so um i don't know maybe elio if you want to to kick off with that one um, so when did I know? Uh, I was very young when I knew that I wanted to do this, uh, but um, specifically to work in Amphioxus, I fell in love with this model system when I saw it the first year in the university. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh my god, this is impossible. Um, this is a living fossil. I have to work with it. And I actually was lucky enough that there was a professor in the same university that was doing research um, on, on it. And the challenges, the challenges are are like in everything, there are many challenges, but I think as as long as you are motivated, you can you can you can move mountains. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna pass on to um Kate, actually. Kate. Um, yeah, you? sure. Um I wanted, to, yeah, so I talked about this a little bit in my presentation, but I, I knew I was interested in sort of science and nature from the time I was a kid. I guess um, I sort of transitioned from rocks to living things. Um, yeah, at the, at the start of grad school, I got really interested in my master's in vertebrate skeletons and that sort of thing. So that was probably probably about, about the time I knew that this is really what I wanted to do. Um, yeah, and challenges, it's, it's interesting to think about because nothing really pops out immediately. But when I think about um, this being International Women's Day, I've never had an advisor that was a woman um, at any level of, you know, university to now. Um, and so that's been, you know, it, it can be hard sometimes when you don't, even if the, the advisors you have who are men, they were all very supportive. 
it can be a little bit tricky when you don't see yourself represented in, you know, the top levels at the university that you're that you're at. So luckily I had many amazing colleagues and lab mates and that sort of thing that were really sort of motivational and inspirational. But I would say that was maybe one challenge is not really not ever having that formal mentor relationship with a woman. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And um, Rahia? Oh, so this um, is the, yeah. Well, I, I've been quite lucky though because I've managed to like find the few women and forced them to like <laughs> it's actually been quite nice because they all have had very varied and different approaches to mentorship so um, I've learned a lot about what works and what doesn't work for you as well because I think you can fall into this trap of all successful women have to look one certain way and I think mm -hmm. just like really getting out there and finding all of the women and making them your friend is really the key to surviving. Yeah, yeah. And Emily, I mean, paleontology is not really known for having lots of women high up. <laughs> well, yeah. yes. Um, so it, it's interesting because actually with Ediacaran Research, we are a small kind of sub-discipline where we actually do have quite a lot of women, very mm -hmm. impressive um, women like Ra uh, Professor Rachel Wood in Edinburgh and Professor Mary Drozer at the um, University of California Riverside, who are really world leaders in Ediacaran Research. And indeed, one of the first people to work on you know, the Ediacaran fossils of Charmwood was Helen, Helen Boynton, who was, yeah, again, <laughs> a woman. And so it's, it's quite interesting because there seem to be a lot more women in Ediacaran research than perhaps other branches of paleontology. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to know how much of that is potentially coincidence or actually the fact we've already seen a lot of incredible women doing really impressive research. And I know that with me, I've had a lot, <laughs> a lot more women um, as um, undergrad uh, um, and grad, grad students than a lot of my other kind of uh, paleo colleagues, which again, it's, I'm not trying to select <laughs> for women, but, uh, yeah. but that seems to what happened. Um, I, I would like to also kind of address the kind of like, when did I want, know I wanted to study zoology because mm -hmm. my undergrad was actually in, in physics. And I did a, a master's of mathematics <laughs> um, before finding, realizing that maths research wasn't quite for me. So I came to it kind of later in life, kind of via paleontology to zoology and understanding, yeah, yeah using the living systems to understand the fossil ones. That's really interesting, but having, you can see that you've really utilized those skills as well <laughs> yes. in the research that you do. That's fantastic. Indeed, yeah. yeah. But, it, but it's interesting because maths um, is very, very male dominated. And actually, when mm -hmm. I was interviewing for grad school, there was um, one department and uh, there, I would have been the only woman at uh, postgraduate level or above. And as I was walking mm -hmm. around, someone shouted, there's a woman in the building. And like everyone came out of their <laughs> offices. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't yeah. get that. <laughs> Gosh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thankfully in zoology, I'm really happy to say that there's there's lots of women around, so we don't have um, <laughs> quite that issue in zoology. That's great. Um, so another question that we've had is, what is the favourite part of your job? Um, I don't know who who'd like to go first. I'll open that to whoever would like to go first. Um, I could talk about a bit yeah. about it. So I think that my favourite the my favourite part of my job is probably just getting to be interested in what I'm actually interested in and pursue that alone. Um, and it's like, you have the freedom and the flexibility to do it. And so there's no one really telling you what to do on a daily basis, um, except yourself. Um, so that is like really part of like the amazing part of being an academic, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being able to follow your, your own curiosity. Yeah, that's great, yeah. Anybody else? What's your what's your favourite part of your job? I, I love being mm -hmm. able to do field work. Um, I, I like being able to kind of come up with an idea, um, mm -hmm. go in the field, collect data, come back, analysing, um, analyse data. It's very, very exciting doing all the maths and <laughs> seeing what your data says for the first time. Yeah. And then and then potentially iterating and then going back and kind of developing uh, mm -hmm. your ideas and your, your data. I think that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Kate or Elia, I don't know. If yes, uh, but I, I, but perhaps what I, my favorite part of the work is when 
I see something that was not known before and you cannot see it in front of your eyes and you say, my gosh, this works like this. I would, you know, and that you have actually been thinking about that being a possibility when, when you experiment show it is such an amazing feeling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with that. When you make a discovery and no one else knows it yet, you're the, the first person to know something in the world. It's really a, a magical feeling. And oh. I'll just add, I mean, I just really love looking at fish and skeletons and going through, I, you know, I get to go through the vertebrate stores that we have here and just pick out really weird looking fish. And then I get to see what they look like inside and, you know, figure out how they, how they got that way. And it's, it's just really magical to, to get to look at really weird anatomy and, you know, see fish develop. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I feel very lucky to work in the museum and just surrounded by this amazing stuff all the time. Um, so just a couple more questions, I think, because we are obviously running over quite a bit, but thank you so much for, for doing this. A couple more questions, one from Hannah Jones. Uh, were your PhDs like a dive in at the deep end or was it more like a step up from when you were doing your master's or um, undergraduate degrees? Um, so maybe if we start with, uh, maybe we start with Elia with this one. Um, I don't know what, what it really means. Um... So did it feel like sort of really a big, a big change in the way that you were working, a big sort of jumping into the deep end, or was it oh, kind I of see. more gradual and not that dissimilar to doing the masters? Okay, um, I mean the way of working during the masters is very different because you know more and you have more techniques at your hand that you can exploit. The masters mm -hmm. are still really very, very <laughs> young <laughs> in mind. <Yeah. laughs> But for me, it was more at um, a graduate, a gradu um, I actually began to work with amphioxus before starting my research career. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so everything has been kind of around having, you know, acquiring the knowledge and the tools that I needed to answer the questions I wanted. So for mm -hmm. me, it has been a very nice kind of um, um, growing growing gradually into all that yeah. yeah that's interesting so I'm going to ask this to, to Kate and Emily now because you've come from slightly different backgrounds to what you're working on now I mean was it did it feel more of a dive into the deep end when you're coming from physics to going into paleontology for example um yeah it was very very kind of big um big jump um mm. from so I did a, a ecology master's actually so I was kind of used to the biology stuff but before I started paleontology but I didn't know any earth science mm -hmm. so I had to learn kind of different sorts of rocks and things. so yeah. that that was definitely a very big jump yeah. luckily um very patient colleagues and supervisors who helped yeah. me <laughs> yeah Okay. Um, yeah, for me, it actually felt a bit a bit more gradual. I think so. I did my master's in the U.S., where they are a little longer than they are here in the U.K. So you do get a couple years to kind of get the hang of things. And so I felt like I got some really good skills during my master's that I didn't sort of struggle as much in my PhD as, as some others who had you know sort of come directly from their undergrad. So yeah, for me, it felt actually a bit more gradual. Okay, and uh, Rahia as well. Did, was it big deep dive into the deep end when you started your PhD? Well, I think like any kind of PhD is a bit of a dive into the deep end because you're basically getting ready to immerse yourself completely into a topic. So I did my PhD in America, where I spent six years on like a single topic, uh, right? So, I mean, it did feel that way, but I will say that every supervisor is very different, and so. You know, whereas some give you a lot of leeway, some will give you a lot more training and hold your hand a bit more. So it's about the right fit as well for you. So when I got to my PhD, I was kind of left alone with a, some money and some mice and they were like, you can do whatever you want. And I was like, this is great. <laughs> I feel like a kid who's been like left home alone. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so... I mean, it worked for me, the strategy worked for me, but um, but at every stage, I would say, like when I moved to my postdoc, it was a steep learning curve because I was trying to learn like a very new skill set. So learning how to do genomics and bioinformatics. And then when I moved to my fellowship, I was like working with this like animal 
that was like very different from all the animals that I've ever dealt with before. And so it's like another steep learning curve. And so you are always kind of learning. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's that's something that's really nice about about doing research though, is that it's, it's a constant learning process, isn't it? It's really, yeah. So I'm gonna ask one last question. And it's one, because it's International Women's Day, um, and I think it's nice to, to highlight the work of women. Um, as it's International Women's Day, it'd be great to know if there was a woman who particularly inspired you, maybe in childhood or during your career. So I'm happy to start with this one. So I think for me, um, the person who really inspired me was actually my grandma, I was very lucky, Doris Parkin, who worked in the natural history department at the museum in Sheffield and taught me to love the natural world. And also that it didn't matter that I was a girl, I could do anything I wanted, and be whatever I wanted. So that was somebody who was really inspirational to me um, throughout my early life. So um, I'm going to go around, I'm going to start off with um, Rahia actually, we can go around, is there, is there anybody? Well, there's like quite a few actually, like I've named the, some of them during my talk and I guess like my mother would be one of them. She was like the original uh, badass, I think, um, <laughs> because she just was sort of like a force of nature. Um, but then I've just managed to like work with kind of insanely smart, nice, interesting women throughout my career. So there's just a lot. Too many. That's, it's great to have too many to name actually. That's a really fantastic thing. <laughs> Yeah, Elia? Uh, I don't know, I'm actually feeling a little bit like uh, uh, like Rahia because um, there's I have so many friends that did my the PhD with uh, with me. I, they were so awesome, all very driven women, amazing. I mean, all of them um, made uh, my time during my PhD amazing, an amazing time despite the stresses and everything. And, and and we we keep in touch um, uh, and it's it's just great talking about science and about everything and of course my mom has been always my inspiration <laughs> she, she, she is you know she is the kind of person that thinks that nothing is impossible and um, you know when I was uh, choosing my my degree everybody wants to, you know all the children to go to medicine and my mom always told me you do study what you want then life will take you where life wants <laughs> and it, it was a, a great advice that I actually can you know can say to everybody that it was a great advice yeah yeah and Kate is there is there anybody who particularly inspired you um, I, I'm going to say when I first started my master's, so this is, you know, the, my first real research and grad school experience, um, there were three women PhD students in my lab and they were amazing role models and kind of taught me what you could do, um, as a PhD student and it, it kind of showed me, showed me the ropes and yeah, like, like Ellie said, we still keep in touch. We have a group chat that is active weekly. You know, every week at least, and it's been you know a, a decade since I was in school with them. So, um, so yeah, those three, I can't pick anyone, but it's been amazing to have a sport network like that that carries on. Yeah, and Emily. Um, well, I'm very lucky in that in my kind of subdiscipline, we have a lot of really incredible women, as I mentioned. Um, but I think what, one thing that I really appreciate is I've got a very good colleague in um, earth science, Dr. Charlotte Kensington, and we did our PhDs about the same time and we worked together very closely. And yeah, it's really fantastic to have um, such a wonderful, intelligent person to be working with <laughs> on, you know, within your field. It's, it's really wonderful. Oh, that's great. I just wanted just like to give a bit of a shout out to all the women out there who are, um, are just such an inspiration. And thank you to all of you as well. And everybody in our audience, everyone who's taken part today. Thank you, Emily, Kate, Elliot and Rahia for your talks are just really fascinating. I, I love listening to them and learning more about your work. Um, and uh, also to the audience for those fantastic questions. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it and would love to know your thoughts. Uh, so you'll be receiving um, a short online survey link by um, Eventbrite. So please do fill that out and let us know what you think. It really helps us with our future planning. Um, so thank you once again, and hopefully we'll see you either at the museum or at an online event again in the future soon.